Let's get ready to story! I got it. <clears throat> Baseball. Carbino. Isabella. Kirk Camoni. Come on down from the back of the hall. Oh, and he's wearing the color. He's got a St. George color out there. Come on up. He's a tall drink of water. Not a chance. They're asking me if I could get this over with in five minutes. You brought an Irish to Jessup and asked a bunch of Italians to talk for five minutes. Mistake number one. For those of you like me that didn't realize that Penn State started at six tonight, it's 34-24, they're losing. Thanks for picking me last. There's about eight minutes left to go in the game. One of the biggest things that struck me tonight, and I think I'm the youngest person that, that is speaking here tonight and didn't know half of the people you people were talking about. But uh, the one thing that struck me is all the things that I had in common with every one of your stories. You know, I too ran from police named Santarelli Pickard. So we have that. Uh, I had a lot in common with Mr. Pickard. I, I drink too. Uh, much like uh, Bobby's brother Jack, I've been referred to as the most handsome man that anyone has ever seen. It's, it's a small town, small world, small town. You know, I mean, we have a lot of common. But, uh, I was outside during the smoke break. I don't smoke, but I'm, I'm fat, and there's a lot of you here, so I needed cold weather. And, uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to talk about, because I went to Cousins to buy a, a tin of chew, and Mrs. Looney asked me, and I, I said yes. And here I am. And, uh... <laughs> Luckily, a Antonia Serta uh, walked past me and she said, well, why don't you tell a story about your father and sausage? <laughs> and in any other town, that would be a really weird story. <laughs> but, it just so happens that I have some amazing stories about my family and sausage. So here we go. When I was a kid, the, the best times I ever had growing up was always when I got to hang around with my godfather, Ronnie Lupini, and my father, Lou Camoni. And it was awesome because I always was hanging out with them, but when I was with them and no one else was around, I was just one of the guys. So they would curse. By the way, Kim Jim Betty, thank you so much for saying shit. Because then it just opened right up. I mean, the guy that taught me how to take math tests and Mrs. Arnoni both made cock jokes. I mean, this night is fantastic. I was afraid I was gonna say hell and everybody's gonna go, ooh. So anyway, they would, they would curse, and, and you weren't allowed to tell anybody, but they just acted like guys, and you got to hang out with them, and it was great too, because I was the younger brother, but my brother didn't hang out with my father and my godfather, because, well, there was three issues. One, everything, you had to get up early. Everything started early, and my, my brother didn't do that. There was always work involved, and he didn't do that. And, and my brother, uh, unfortunately, he, he's Irish. So it wouldn't have been much fun for him. <laughs> much like you, you referred to before, my father is Italian and my mother is Irish, but where my family is different is I got all of the Italian and my brother got the Irish. My father must have had a recessive gene for pale and freckly and it went to my brother, which was fortunate for me. I mean, he's a genius lawyer in New York City and but I have greasy skin so I still think I won. I'm definitely definitely the winner. So I would always hang out with Ronnie and my dad. Now the only thing you had to, you always had to deal with was I got the crappy job. 
whatever we were doing, I always got the crappy job. So we were building a stone wall, and I said, I don't know how to build a stone wall. And they said, don't worry about it, show up at 6 o'clock. And my godfather looked at me and said, you're Italian. There's masonry in your blood. Show up at 6 a.m. Everything started at 6. I don't understand what was wrong with these guys. <laughs> so I show up. I'm ready to build a wall. We're going to build the wall. You climb down the embankment, grab that 250-pound rock, tie the broken metal, come along to it, and we'll drag you up with the truck. <laughs> I, I didn't have that in my blood. I... <laughs> When the come along broke and almost decapitated me and I'm down in embankment bleeding, they opened up a brand new heavy duty strap that I could tie around that took us easily to safety. And I said, well, now we have to roll it up again. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that extra effort. <laughs> then there was, I need you to come up. We got some pester on, we got to set the traps. All right, I'll come up and we'll, do, we'll start to set some traps. I show up, and they go, we already caught it, it's a skunk, go cover it with the tarp. <laughs> I think I know now why my brother didn't hang out. <laughs> so, they finally invited me to come. My godfather, Ronnie Lupini, made the best sausage I have ever tasted in my life. And I know what you're thinking, you look at me, I've tasted a lot of sausage. <laughs> Again, in another town, that would be a really weird story, but... <laughs> so he made the best sausage known to man. He grew up making it, he learned how to make it from Jessup's King of Sausage, Ray Chicote. Over the years, he adapted it and made it his own, and it was the best. So they finally invited me to come up, and I couldn't believe it. This, it was like, you know, a bar mitzvah for a Jew. I got to make sausage, I'm a man. I go up into the kitchen, 6 a.m., of course, you can't make sausage any later than that, that would be crazy. <laughs> go to the sausage kitchen, it was down in the basement, I walked in and it was like, oh, everything was stainless steel, everything was amazing, I couldn't wait to get started. They open up these boxes, it's cases of pork butts with the bone in. Again, this story couldn't have so many meanings. <laughs> They flap them out on the table, and they have all these unbelievably sharp knives. And guys, I, you people are going to know what I'm talking about. None of these knives looked like the blade came with the handle. <laughs> the handle was like prehistoric, and the blade had been run on a wheel in, in Ronnie's garage about 7,000 times. But they swear, and they're not kidding. I mean, if you looked at this thing the wrong way, you, were, you needed stitches. So it was unbelievable. So they start, they, and I'm watching them intently, I can't wait to try it, and they're carving out the bone on this pork butt, and I grab a pork butt, and I open it up, and I went to grab one of the knives, and I got slapped on the hand. The only time I think I've ever been slapped like that on the hand was the time my Nona stabbed me with a fork when I tried to cross the polenta line on the board to grab a piece of sausage. <laughs> stabbed me. I was, I was five. <laughs> and I was told you don't cross over the line when you're eating polenta on the board. You draw the line, that's your barrier. You don't go over there. I don't care how bad you want a piece of sauce. <laughs> it didn't work out that well for me when I stabbed my little cousin, Samantha. I got smacked in the back of the head and I got called an idiot. Another thing we have in common, my father had a catchphrase too. He said, Mary, my mother's name, Mary, the boy is an idiot. <laughs> but instead of doing this and this, he just went like that. But, so they grabbed, they hit me in the hand. They said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm gonna grab a knife. I'm gonna take the bone out of the butt. And they said, no, 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 no. You gotta you got know what you're doing for that. We'll give you a different knife. We have a different job for you. <laughs> And he opened the drawer and pulled out a knife that cut as well as a spoon. <laughs> and they proceeded to take the bones out. They were done. They hunked all this meat up and said, cut the bad fat, leave the good fat, cube it up. And they sat and had a coffee. <laughs> Mr. Pickard's hard of hearing. He didn't hear that bell, so I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> so I start cubing the meat and cutting the bad fat, which I figured out on my own which kind was bad and kept the good one and got everything hunked up. All right, now weigh it out. I piled everything in the containers and I went over to the scale and I turned it on and it was brand new. And they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm gonna weigh the 
the pork. He said, not that, you gotta use that. And I looked over and there was this ancient machine with what looked like Sanskrit written on it. <laughs> it looked like the cash register at Sui's Market when I was a kid. I, there was no chance I could, I could read this thing, so I was told I was an idiot and then they weighed the meat. There was seven lines on it. It literally went across like this and it started wheeling like that. I don't, I don't know how you do it to this day. And there's a digital scale right there. <laughs> So it comes time to season the meat. This is, everybody uses pork for sausage pretty much. Here's the secret, here's the recipe. Time to season it. Kurt, leave the room. I said, what? He said, get out. I said, what are you talking about? My father said, Ronnie promised Rachel Cody 40 some odd years ago, he would never show anybody how to make the sausage and he, he keeps his word. I said, I just cut up 120 pounds of meat with a spoon. I don't get to know how much pepper. Get out. So I get out of the room. Come back in. We're making the sausage. I can't wait. I'm going to grind the meat. This is going to be fantastic. They go, no, no, no. We have, we have a different job for you. You're going to tie the links. And at this point, Rachel Cody had come in. Ray didn't have to work at 6 a.m. He got to show up like at 11. And he goes, Ray, show Kurt how to tie the links. And here's this, I mean, he's an older gentleman, and, and this is a while ago, but he was old then too. And the man looked like Alan Iverson doing a crossover dribble. I've never seen anything like it. He, had, he walked over to me with these claws. And amazingly, as soon as he touched the twine, it was like the fountain of youth, and, and he's going like this, and sausage links are just moving along like they're on a conveyor belt. And I'm standing there watching this, and then they go, all right, do the rest. And they sat down and had a coffee. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I think I got called an idiot a couple more times, but sausage turns out fantastic. So I'm begging Ronnie and I'm harassing him. And I said to him, Ronnie, I'm your godson. You know, someday, I'm assuming at this point, I think I was about 15, maybe even less, I'm probably gonna outlive you. <laughs> I'm gonna wanna eat sausage at some point after you go. And then Ronnie, unfortunately, died very young. I felt horrible about that. And Rachel Cody comes over to me and my father in the funeral home. And he says, I talked to Jeannie. She wants, she's talking to my, he's talking to my father. He wants you to have the recipe for sausage. We'll make it and I'll come and help you out. So we go down in the kitchen, we make the sausage. My father, me and Rachel Cody, it comes time to season the meat. Kurt, get out. <laughs> And I'm looking at Rachel Cody, I go, seriously, I gotta, I mean, I gotta get out. Just, just, just go. At least this time they handed me a sharp knife. My father, unfortunately, passes away very young. I'm standing in the funeral home and Rachel Cody walks over to me and he goes, I talked to your Aunt Jeannie. She wants you to have the recipe for the sausage. Call me and we'll go and we'll make it. And I looked at Ray and I said, fuck you, did you see what happened to the last two guys? <laughs> Thank you everybody, enjoy your night.